Okay, shalom everyone and welcome to another Thursday night study. We are on Psalm 120. You know, it's, we've come a long way. <laughs> and uh, the psalm is is a pretty short one. It's only seven verses compared to Psalm 119, which is so long it took weeks to get through. But um, Psalm 120, you know, wow. And I, t- I titled the study this week, there is always the opportunity for repentance. Okay, and so, um, and this is part one. And uh, let me turn the sound off. That way we're not hearing all the emails that come in. Okay, so um, there are seven verses in Psalm 120. Let's, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time that we can come together and study your word, Lord. It is, is awesome that we have the scriptures by, I believe, by divine miracle that we have them today. Lord, I ask as we study your word that you would speak to our hearts, help us to apply your truths to our lives for your glory. We just give you all the glory and the honor and the praise in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so in Psalm 120, let's uh, read through the scripture first and then we'll begin. And it says, In my trouble I cried to the Lord, and he answered me, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips, from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given to you, and what more shall be done to you, you deceitful tongue? Sharp arrows of the warrior with the burning coals of the broom tree. Woe is me, for I sojourn in Meshech, for I dwell among the tents of Kedar. Too long has my soul had its dwelling with those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Okay, so Psalm 120. And there were only seven verses in the psalm. And it opens with the verse that says, In my trouble I cried to the Lord and he answered. Okay, so um, when we think about that, crying out to the Lord and seeking an answer from the Lord, you know, how often have you prayed and you know without a doubt that the Lord has answered your prayer? You know, what do you think? You know, prayer is such a great blessing, and we are promised that our Heavenly Father is always listening, but often it takes some work to recognize His answers. If we consider the two ends of this discussion, one, either God hears you, or two, He doesn't. And if the Lord does not hear our prayers, then of course there is no point in praying. But if He does, and rest assured that He does, we have to figure out, how to recognize his answers, and then faithfully move forward. Now, regardless of whether we feel the Lord hears our prayers or not, we are to continue to move forward in the way of righteousness, holiness, and truth. And when we feel he is not listening, maybe we need to experience some personal growth. A few good questions to ask ourselves when this situation occurs are, am I pure in my intentions during prayer? Or are my motives worthy? Or am I willing to do what he asks of me? And so if the answer to each of these is yes, you can trust that the Lord does hear your prayers. Remember also, the Lord of the universe isn't under obligation to say yes to every prayer. And that is a good thing, considering some of the things that we request. In addition, Sometimes answers to come in uh, subtle or unexpected ways. So according to the scriptures, we read that Job led a righteous life and he maintained the correct motives for what he did. Yet disaster came his way. And while Job was trying to understand what was happening to him and why he prayed the following prayer. And we look at Job chapter 30 verse 20. The chapter 31, verse 23, and it says the following. It says, I cry out to you for help, but you do not answer me. I stand up, and you turn your attention against me. You have become cruel to me with the might of your hand. You persecute me. You lift me up to the wind and cause me to ride, and you dissolve me in a storm. For I know that you will bring me to death and to the house of meeting for all living. Yet does not one in a heap of ruins stretch out his hand, or in his disaster therefore cry out for help? Have I not wept for the one whose life is hard? Was not my soul grieved for the needy? When I expected good and then evil came, when I waited for light, then darkness came. 
I am seething within and cannot relax. Days of affliction confront me. I go about mourning without comfort. I stand up in the assembly and cry out for help. I have become a brother to jackals and a companion of ostriches. My skin turns black on me and my bones burn with fever. Therefore my harp is turned to mourning and my flute to the sound of those who weep. I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then can I gaze at a virgin? And what is the portion of God from above or the heritage of the Almighty, Almighty from on high? Is it not calamity to the unjust and disaster to those who work iniquity? Does he not see my ways and number all my steps? If I have walked with falsehood and my foot has hastened after deceit, let him weigh me with accurate scales and let God know my integrity. If my step is turned from the way or my heart followed my eyes, or if any spot is stuck to my hands, let me sow and another eat and let my crops be uprooted. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or I have lured or lurked at my neighbor's doorway, may my wife grind for another and let others kneel down over her, for that would be a lustful crime. Moreover, it would be an iniquity punishable by judges, for it would be fire that consumes to abaddon and would uproot all my increase. If I had displeased the claim of my fa- male or female slaves when they filed a complaint against me, What then could I do when God arises? And when he calls me to account, what will I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make him and the same one fashion us in the womb? If I have kept the poor from their desire, or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel alone, and the orphan has not shared it, but from my youth he grew up with me as with a father, and from infancy I guided her, if I have seen another perish for lack of clothing, or that the needy have not have no covering, if his loins have no, not thanked me, and if he has not been warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have lifted up my hand against the orphan, because I saw that I had support in the gate, let my shoulder fall from the socket, and my arm be broken off at the elbow, for calamity from God is terror to me, and because of his majesty I can do nothing. Okay, so that was... That was from Job, chapter 30, verse 20, to chapter 31, verse 23. And it's interesting how Job also felt as if the Lord did not or would not answer his prayers. Job couples the concept of sexual sin to hearing from the Lord. And the idea is that the desire of the eyes in combination with the heart leads to actions, and those actions are what Job's friends are claiming have led to his calamity. Job speaks of having taken care of the widow and the poor person and clothed those who are in need of clothing. And yet, while doing all of these things in service to the Lord, the God of Israel brought calamity against not only him, but his family as well. His children had died. And this is a difficult thing to accept by some due to the modern theology that God is love and he would not cause hardship or pain to come upon a person. Job said that, He was innocent, and based upon the narrative of the book of Job, he was indeed innocent and a righteous man. And for both of these things, the Lord used him as an example of righteousness, that in the midst of his hardship, his pain, and his calamity, he did not blaspheme the Lord, and he maintained his faith. The point is, no matter what the circumstances we are called, no matter what the circumstances that happen in our lives, we are called to persevere in our faith meaning that we are to remain faithful to the Lord. And this is why Yeshua did not place a condition upon what he said in regards to prayer, that we are to continue to seek the Lord in the midst of our troubles and believe, and we will receive what we ask for. And, for example, in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, from the New American Standard Bible, Therefore I say unto you, all things for which you pray and ask believe that you have received them, and they will be granted you. Yeshua states that all believing prayer will receive the believed result. And this scripture also implies that unbelieving prayer may not receive. And there's also hope, or there's always hope in God's mercy. Now the prayer David asks of the Lord is the following. In, in Psalm 120, verse 2, it says, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. The deceitful tongue is synonymous to the deceitful heart. 
the evil inclination, or the Lashon Hara, as, as the rabbis call it. David asks, also saying in verse 3, What shall be given to you, and what more shall be done to you, you deceitful tongue? And so, on uh, David speaking specifically about the tongue, and the deceitful nature of the tongue, right? And so the question is, is David speaking of punishment that is due to the deceitful tongue? And has deception, deception become second nature to the extent that it is what goes through the narratives of the heart on a daily basis, seeking how to deceive? You know, I think that is a really good question that we should be asking ourselves. You know, when, when we go through the day and if someone makes you mad, you know, and, um, or upsets you in some, for some reason or whatever, um, do you play off scenarios in your head how you can get back at him? You know, have you done that? I've, I've done that. You know, I'll admit to that. You know, and then I asked the Lord to forgive me for that after, after a while <laughs> and thinking about that. And then it's like, oh, that wasn't right. You know, and Lord forgive me. And so um, I think that that's a very, very important thing to, to consider is the motivation of our heart. And are we, are we coming up with these thoughts and these narratives in our heart on a daily ba- basis? To seek the undoing of someone else, I think that that would be really that's really bad. Another question is, um, have you ever sought to be cleansed of sin in the sense that one day we will stand before our Father in heaven, and you do not want to look around with deception, lust, covetousness, or some other sin remaining in the heart? You know, I think this is a really important thing because. Um, I've thought about this this very topic for um, quite some time, and when we think about this, that when we enter into the faith in Yeshua, that we're told that our sins are not only forgiven, but they are they are taken away, right? And for those who do not believe in Yeshua, that their sins will remain. And so when they stand before the Father in the Olam Haba that their sins will remain whereas our sins will be taken you know and and so the idea is is that we we seek i seek you know and i'm sure you guys do too but um we seek for cleansing from sin for the purpose that we can stand before god in righteousness and holiness and in truth right and uh, we don't want to have some kind of hidden sin so that when we go before him that it's it's um exposed you know for what it is we want to be uh, set free from that right you know I, I do now according to the scriptures deceiving others is strictly forbidden and we look at the Talmud Bavli in Pesachim 113b it states that the Holy One blessed be he hates a person who says one thing with his mouth and another in his heart so we're not to be double-minded right and defrauding uh, for example defrauding by the seller overcharging or by the buyer under pen underpaying is also condemned and this is the example that is given to us of having unjust scales where the mishnah in bava metzia for part 10 states as there is wronging in buying and selling there is wronging with words a man must not ask how much is this thing if he has no intention of buying it. Okay, so note how there is something about a person asking for a price when he is not really interested in buying, and that is related to having unjust scales. Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, He said, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with what measure you met out, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in your own eye? So here, Yeshua suggests that the concept of unjust scales may also be applied to the one who is judging someone else due to their sins. And this is consistent with the Lord wanting justice and truth, for our lives, you know, and we should also want justice and truth for others. And note that, you know, based upon our own life experience and the mercy that we've received from the Lord, we should also show mercy to others, you know, because we don't always know 
the um, the events of a person's life that has led them to where they are today, right? And so that I believe that's why the rabbis say that each person is an entire world because we we all have our our own world, the world in which we grew up in, right? And so and that shapes and forms and molds the way that we not only understand the things around us. It helps us, and it, it molds the way we understand Scripture. It molds the way we understand our Father in Heaven, you know. And so um, we need to be very careful how we judge others, you know, and that we are showing mercy and that we are uh, giving a, a liberal amount of love towards others because uh, we don't know what kind of life they, they had to endure, you know, to get to where they are today. Now, um, and I believe that's why Yeshua used this example here in relation to the judge, not lest you be judged, and the in relation to using unjust scales. That when we we uh, we look at someone else, we should try to be as as unjudging as possible. And um, this is again consistent with the Lord wanting justice and truth for our lives. The very thing that David is seeking the Lord for deliverance from in Psalm 120, verse two. Now another. Quoting a quoted rabbinic saying, you know, from the Talmud Bavli in Shabbat 55a, it states, "Truth is the seal of the Holy One. Blessed be He." Now, and this is from Rashi, and in Rashi's experience, ex- explanation, he describes this saying as referring to the Hebrew word for truth, emet, which is formed from the first letter of the alphabet, the middle letter mem, and the last letter tav. And he says that the God of truth is found wherever there is truth, and his absence is felt wherever there is falsehood. Um, and Ellie says that we can't judge fruit, but we or we can judge fruit, but we can never motive or another's heart. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Now Jeremiah the prophet he said uh, something similar, and it says in Jeremiah ten ten that the Lord is truth, and the psalmist declares in Psalm one hundred nineteen verse one hundred forty two that the Torah is truth. And David also writes that, and he speaks the truth in his heart in Psalm 15, verse 2. One explanation by the Jewish commentators is that is the God-fearing man should keep his promise even if he only made it in his heart. Even if it was no more than a promise he had kept to himself without revealing it to the one that he had made it, to whom he had made it. Now David, in... Another psalm, he says something very similar. In Psalm chapter 10, verses 1 through 12, it says the following. It says, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In pride, the wicked, the wicked hotly pursue the, the afflicted. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire, and the greedy man curses, curses and spurns the Lord. The wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper all the times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for all his adversaries, he snorts at them. He says to himself, I will not be moved. Throughout all generations, I will not be in adversity. His mouth is full of curses and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. He sits in the lurking places of the villages, in the hiding places, He kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. He lurks in a hiding place as a lion in his lair. He lurks to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted when he draws him into his net. He crouches, he bows down, and the unfortunate fall by his mighty ones. He says to himself, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the afflicted. Okay, so that was Psalm, uh, Psalm 10, verses 1 through 12. And, and in that Psalm, David seeks his same, this same question of whether the Lord hears his prayer or not, asking why the Lord seems to stand afar off in times of trouble. The unrighteous man boasts in his wicked and unrighteous heart, saying that there is no God who brings justice. And this type of wickedness is what, what Radak describes in his commentary on uh, Psalm 10, verse 8, part 1, 2, and 3. You can see on page 5, and it says the following. It says that he sits in the places of ambush of the villages, 
The villages are the open towns which are upon the highways. As her crown or her towns, her daughters and her villages, the villages in that Kedar bo- doth inhabit. Similarly, we find Jerusalem shall dwell as open regions. In part two, in the secret places doth he murder the innocent. For usually the wicked does not do his wicked work openly, but he sits in ambushes and secret places that he may be uh, beware of the sons of men, so that they may not see him. But he cannot beware of the all-seeing God. <clears throat> then part three, his eyes lie in wait for the hapless. It, then lechalcha uh, is equivalent to halach with the addition of he in its interpretation for the poor. He says that the eyes of the wicked are on the lookout for the poor to take him. And to lie in wait for is an an intransitive verb as if he meant he sets his eyes in a hidden place and from thence looks out over the roads. Okay, so um, Radak speaks of the unrighteous as hiding in secret places for the purpose to leap out and murder the innocent. Murder may come in many forms. One way to bring down the innocent is by the way of charging interest. You know, for example, and this increases the burden to pay back a debt. It's interesting. Um, is if interest is too high and the payments go beyond the means of the one who's in debt, it's impossible to become debt free, and this may lead to slavery, as in the case of the one who is in debt, slave and selling himself in order to pay off his debt, or in the sense that. One spends all his means to pay off his debt, not having enough even for food to feed his family. Radak sees the eyes of the wicked are on the poor to take him down, and he lies in wait to do so, even by the means of an indirect method of bringing him down in any way that he is able. Now in Deuteronomy 7, verse 12 to 8, verse 10, Moshe told the children of Israel that if, if they obeyed the Lord God of Israel, he would remain faithful to the covenant. He would bless them with fertility and agricultural productivity and would ward off sickness. Moshe directed the people to destroy all of the seven nations in the land of Canaan, those whom the Lord, the Lord had delivered to them, and to utterly destroy their places of worship, not serving their gods. Moshe tells the people not to fear these nations because they were numerous, but to recall what the Lord God did to Pharaoh and the Egyptians and the wonders by which the Lord had liberated them. The God of Israel would do the same to the peoples whom they feared and would would send a plague against them. The Torah states the Lord himself would dislodge those people little by little so that the wild beasts would not take over the land. Moshe directed the people to burn the images of their God, not to covet, nor keep the silver and gold on them, nor to bring an abhorrent thing into their houses. And in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1 to 9, verse 3, Moshe warned the Israelites not to forget the Lord God, not to violate his commands, and not to grow haughty, and believe that it was by their own power that they had won their wealth, but to remember the Lord had given them the power to prosper. In Deuteronomy 8.18, in Parashat Echeb. Moshe warns that if they forget the Lord and follow other gods, then they would certainly perish like the nations that are driven out and displaced from the land. Moshe warned the Israelites that they were to dispossess nations greater than they, but God would go before them as a devouring fire to drive out the land's inhabitants. In this blessing the Lord gives to his people speaks of the importance of our having the correct motivation to walk in God's ways according to his commands. And, for example, to follow in the footsteps of the Messiah, because he he had uh, given us the example in doing so. And in doing so, our Father in heaven will recognize us as his children in doing the things that he says he will do for us. The enemy will be dispossessed, and the Lord himself will will be involved in doing so. Now, in the psalm, David speaks of these things in the following way. He says in verse 4, Sharp arrows of the warrior with the burning coals of the broom tree. Broom tree yeah. So the deceitfulness of sin is paralleled to the arrows of the enemy and the burning of the broom tree. And so um, why I read that about the broom tree, um, that uh, 
um, he had and okay so I, I read about the broom broom tree I was wondering what what is it about the broom tree I, I don't know that I've ever noticed this about the broom tree before and when studying the broom tree I, I googled it right and the it reveals that um, the broom tree and fire the broom tree produces long burning coals that may, may, may be manufactured from the broom bush and we read in first kings chapter 19 verses 4 through 5 that um elisha sat under this and i'm not sure about jeremiah um i think it was elijah elijah sat and in it says here in first kings 19 verses 4 through 5 it says um but he himself went on day's journey to the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, is it, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And be, behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Yeah, Elijah. And so Elijah had run because of all the prophets of the Lord were being killed, and his life was in danger. We're told that he sat down beneath a broom tree and requested that his life would end. So, the obvious question is why the choice of a broom tree? Why, why would Elijah lay under the broom tree? Um, was this the predominant species of tree in the region that he fled to? I don't know. You know, is there a deeper meaning behind the broom, broom tree under which he slept? I don't know. You know, was it believed the broom tree was the bush the Lord spoke to Moshe through? I don't know. You know, that's a good question. And was the broom tree the burning bush mentioned in the Torah? You know, I didn't I didn't look that up, you know, as, but um, those are all good questions. But regardless of the meaning of the broom tree, David in his psalm and the rabbis in the Talmud described the broom, broom tree as having a special kind of wood that is long burning. And so in the Talmud Bavli in Shabbat 37b, it says the following. It says, Rabbi Bar Bar Hanna said that Rabbi Yohanan said with regard to a stove that he swept out or covered with ashes before Shabbat and subsequently reignited on Shabbat one may leave hot water that was already completely heated and cook food that was already completely cooked upon it even if the coals were from the wood of a broom tree which are very hot and long burning if so Conclude from this that even if food shrivels and improves while on a stove, it is permitted. The Gemara rejects this. Here in this case, it is different because um, he covered it with ashes. Therefore, it is permitted to leave it on the stove. The Gemara asks, if so, what was the purpose of saying this halacha? The Gemara answers mention of the verse where he covered it with ashes and it reignited on Shabbat was necessary. The Gemara challenges that explanation, this case is identical to the previous one. Why did Rabbi Yohanan find it necessary to repeat what was already said? And the Gemara responds that there is a novel element in his statement. It was necessary to teach the case of coals for the wood of a broom tree. Even in the case of especially hot coals, it is permitted. Okay, So the rabbis are speaking of cooking food. On the Shabbat in a broom tree that produces coals that may remain lit on in into the Shabbat and of the Sabbath day. And this idea is coupled to obeying God's word, keeping his command, and keeping his command of the Sabbath rest. The rabbis in the Talmud go on to use the broom bush in an example of keeping Torah or not keeping Torah according to the Talmud according to the Talmud in the in um, Hagiga 12b and I'll tie all this stuff together here in a moment it says with regard to the aforementioned verse Reish Lakish said whoever occupies himself with Torah at night the Holy One blessed be he extends a thread of kindness over him by day as it is stated by day the Lord will command his kindness and what is the reason that by day the Lord will command his kindness because and in the night, his song, the song of Torah, is with me. And some say that Reish Lakish said, whoever occupies himself with Torah in this world, which is comparable to night, 
The Holy One, blessed be He, extends a thread of kindness over him in the world to come, which is comparable to day, as it is stated, by the day the Lord will command His kindness, and at night he sing, or His song is with me. With regard to the same matter, Rabbi Levi said, anyone who passes from the words of Torah to occupy himself with mundane conversation will be fed with the coals of the broom tree. As it is stated, they plucked saltworth with wormwood, and the roots of the broom tree are their food. Their food in Job 30 verse 4. The exposition is as follows. Those who pluck, for example, pause from learning Torah, which is given upon tablets, luchot, you know, which sounds similar to um, the word malua, for the purpose of sia, idle chatter, are punished by having to eat coals made from the roots of the broom, broom tree. And from where do we derive that maon is called heaven? As it is stated, look forth from your holy maon, from heaven, Deuteronomy 26:15. Okay, so there's discussions from the Talmud and the rabbis in in Hagiga 12b. The rabbis speak of the importance of studying the Torah and say that the one who occupies himself with Torah during the night, the Lord extends kindness over him by day. The night in the darkness is paralleled in the scriptures, as we know, to unrighteousness. And the idea here may be that for those for the one who applies himself to studying the Torah rather than choosing unrighteousness, this illustrates one's devotion to the Lord and his word. The Talmud states that by day the Lord will command his kindness, where the light is paralleled to the righteous, you know, to righteousness. And naturally, the righteousness of God is commanded during the light of day, just as it says. The, this world, night, you know, it might be parallel to night, is full of sin, and the world to come, the Alam Haba, is parallel to day, is full of righteousness, holiness, justice, and truth. The point is, is that we are to take um, time to consider and to contemplate, contemplate the words of Torah. If one chooses to occupy himself with mundane conversations, will be fed with the coals of the broom tree. And note. The, the lingering nature of the coal, its ability, you know, the tree's ability to produce coals that remain for a very long time. This implies suffering in going to those who do not take time to draw near to the Lord in his word, who do not take time to study Torah. And this implies uh, suffering going to those who do not choose to draw near to the Lord. These things uh, may be parallel to the effects of sin in our lives. The, the disregard for God's word will lead to great suffering as a result of the sin in one's life and in this world. Then David, in his psalm, he concludes, he says in verses 5 through 7, he says, Woe is me, for I sojourn in Meshech, for I dwell among the tents of Kedar. Too long has my soul had its dwelling with those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Now, sin in our lives functions in a way that is constantly at war with the Spirit, whereas the Spirit the Lord gives to a man is that of peace and joy. Meshech is named as the son of Japheth in Genesis 10, verse 2, and in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 5. Another Meshech is named as a son of Aram in 1 Chronicles 1, verse 17. Aram is located east of Israel, where the enemy of Israel, they were, they were the enemy of Israel. And this is illustrated by David's words saying that he sojourned in Meshech and dwelled in Kedar, and that his soul was too long for those who hate peace. He was too long with those who hate peace. Aram was the Hebrew designation for the nation of Syria. Therefore, the Arameans is a reference to Syrians. And note, the English translations of Second Kings chapter seven verse six, and you can find the translations at the Biblehub.org. You can get all the translations on one page, um, where the translators substituted the word Syrian for the Hebrew word for Aramean, and so um, the borders of Aram encompassed a broad region immediately to the northeast of Israel, extending to the Euphrates River and including Mesopotamia. Among the major cities inhabited by ancient Arameans were Damascus and Hamath. 
Much later, Syrian Antioch was built and is mentioned in the apostolic writings, you know, in Acts chapter 11 verse 19 and chapter 13 verse 1. Note, note also when Abraham sought a wife for his son Isaac, he sent a servant to the land of Aram to find Rivka, right? Rebecca. You find that in Genesis 24 and 25. And then also we know Laban, uh, Jacob's father-in-law, was called an Aramean in Genesis chapter 31, verse 10. Jacob himself was also called a wandering Aramean in Deuteronomy 26, verse 5. Since both his mother and his grandfather were from Mesopotamia and therefore considered Arameans. So during the reign of King David, the Arameans of Damascus came to the help of another group of Syrians. David defeated them and the Arameans were forced to pay tribute. Later, the Arameans joined forces with the Ammonites in war against Israel in 2 Samuel chapter 10. The Israelites defeated Aram again and kept them in subjugation, which is described during the reign of King Solomon. Following the death of Solomon, the Arameans were a thorn in Israel's side. They fought against Israel during King Ahab's time in Israel 1, 1 Kings chapter 20. And another battle with the Arameans, however, led to the death of Ahab. We we'll read that of Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse 34. The Arameans raided Israel and later laid siege to the capital, Samaria. Uh, let's see, yeah, to the capital of Samaria, Second Kings chapter 6. Elisha prophesied the atrocities that the Arameans would commit in in Second Kings chapter 8. And the Arameans fought King Joram of Israel and wounded him, and they fought King Joash of Judah and wounded him. In addition, the eventual fall of Jerusalem at the hands of Babylon was aided by the Arameans. We read this in Second Kings chapter 24. The history of Israel reveals the Arameans were at war with Israel for a very long time, and David says that these people do not love peace but war. And something to note. David says in Psalm 120, verse 7, that I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. So those, uh, though these people chose war over peace, there were some Syrians who sought the God of Israel. And in 2 Kings chapter 5, we're told of Naaman, the Syrian, who had leprosy. Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was an enemy of Israel. However, he humbled himself enough to seek the help of the God of Israel. And Naaman learned that the God of Israel is merciful to all those who call upon him, even those who would determine their hearts to make war against God's people. There is, and so, you know, this illustrates for us that there is always the need, or there's always the opportunity to repent, to turn from our sins, and to seek the God of Israel. And this is a wonderful demonstration of God's mercy in his power to forgive. And so um, that concludes the psalm study for tonight. Um, you know, I, I was reading through this again here tonight, and I was reading through, uh, you know, where we I read from the, the Talmud and discussed that the, you know, the light and the darkness, you know, the righteousness and unrighteousness, and occupying ourselves with the study of Torah as opposed to... Uh, not doing so, right, and having the proper motivation in our lives to uh, to seek the Lord, to love his word, you know, and I think that I could have gone a lot more further in that section, but I, I, I didn't, I ran out of time, and so anyway, so that, that concludes the psalm study for tonight, uh, if um, you have any questions, you can comment on the YouTube channel, um, let me, I'll release the mic and see if anyone has any comments.